Welcome to the Every Brain Matters podcast. It's just pot. What's the problem? I'm your host, Aubrey Adams, and director of Every Brain Matters. The Every Brain Matters community educates about the health and environmental dangers of marijuana and the drug culture expansion by providing support for families and advocacy based on lived experiences and science. Today, we talk to a concerned father who did not realize when he supported legal marijuana in his country that it would lead to his son experiencing cannabis-induced psychosis. We welcome you, Mike, today um, on the Every Brain Matters podcast. Thank you for your willingness to share what happened to your family. Mike, can you describe what your family was like and what your son was like prior to his marijuana use? Sure, sure. So we're a family of four, um, two boys, um, been married for over, you know, for 25 years, uh, tight knit. I mean, very close. We are. We 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 move as a unit. We always have. Uh, both my sons are involved in sports. They're both very active in school. I coach. I coach them from the time that they could do sports to up to even now. Um, very involved. I mean, we're. We're the kind of parents that wants to get to know their friends. We're the kind of parents that, you know, if you have a new friend, we would love to meet him or her. Um, both my wife and I are, you know, we're, we're lucky enough that we have jobs that afford us the flexibility of a uh, home work balance. And so I would say, <laughs> All of our free time has been devoted to both our kids. There is really not much time for us even because it's 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 them. It's them. Um, very involved. I mean, we're we're. I don't want to call myself a helicopter parent, but <laughs> to a certain degree, um, we've always had a plan. We've always knew what we wanted. We always guided them. You know. But at the same time, we didn't want to be so overbearing that we didn't let them make their own decisions because we wanted to make sure that they developed that sense of independency. Um, very bright kids. I mean, both of them are honor roll students consistently. Um, you know, very smart, very, very outgoing. Um, and yeah, it's just, it's, it's hard for me to describe the level of attention that we've given these kids over the years. It's just, um, we've devoted our lives to them in a way. That's, um, that's wonderful. You sound like you have a beautiful, well-connected family. Mm-hmm. And we're going to share with the audience that Mike has agreed to speak to, speak to us today, as long as we, we don't know his identity. Um, we want to uh, honor the uh, privacy that he has asked for. We are allowed to say that he lives in a country that has federally legalized marijuana. And mm-hmm. when that, Mike, when that happened in your country, what what did you think about it? Were you concerned at all? Not at all. Um, the part of the country that I live in has been extremely liberal to to, to marijuana use. Um, it's almost viewed as a rite of passage for teenagers. It's almost viewed as a cultural um, phenomenon, if, I, you know, if that makes sense. It's, it, it, it's culturally accepted to the point that even before legalization, um, you could openly smoke on the streets without the law enforcement, you know, um, you know, it was just, it's a very relaxed 
culture when it comes to marijuana and it's it's very accepted it's very um it's everywhere it's world renowned for it and when the legalization came everyone thought you know about time it's just about time um what we didn't know is what exactly are we dealing with now i grew up you know late 80s early 90s and 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 sure you know yeah it's 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 pot it's it's just marijuana it's it's something that the kids will do and just get ready for it because it's it's part of growing up it's become it's become sort of like our version of apple pie and and friday night football for for, for the americans and that's what it is for us here it's just accepted it's it's something that you talk about something that you engage in conversation so in a way i was i'm not anti marijuana i don't want to come across as that i think that there's a place for legalization and regulation cuz you know if you're not going to get it the legal way there's always someone that's going to provide it for you it, it's not hard to find drugs on the streets so i i welcomed it you know i thought about time it's 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 time that 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 society moves forward and i still kind of view it in that from that lens but what i didn't know was what the hell is shatter and what the hell is dabs and what the hell is distillate pens and what the hell is um concentrates and 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 what do you mean thc has a potency level of 85 to 95% like that was not part of the package or it was never communicated in any way shape or form to the public so even now you talk to people about legalization and they're talking about the wheat that was smoked in in the 60s and in 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 Woodstock and and that's the, sort of the image that you get when you hear about it. Uh, no I, one talks about this. Yeah, I totally agree. It's it's I don't think we should refer to it as marijuana anymore or it's just pot. I mean, it's what I call industrialized THC. Um and so yeah. Big time. It's shocking. Um so when when did you start to see your son's behaviors changed? And when you saw that, were, did you know he was using any of these products? Um, this came as an avalanche to us. Um, we've never seen, my son has never been up to that point, um, a very outgoing child, very... Um, very secure of himself, lots of friends, very popular. And it was a period of about 3 weeks when we started to notice an increased level of sure, how should I say, an increased level of just self aware, self uh, I'm 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 super confident. And I kind of welcomed it because I thought, you know what? It's around grad. It's 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 he's discovering himself. Um, we had just gotten accepted and early accepted into the the local university, so we were over the moon because he had worked so hard, um, and he got into the program that he wanted. And then, you know, because of his grades were so strong that he got early acceptance. So that was sort of the vibe that we were in before this happened. Just getting you know excited that university is just around the corner you're now entering a new stage of your life and so for a period of about 3 weeks we just thought you know great he just he's just over the moon he's 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 got a new group of friends he's he's now finding himself and so he was 18 at this time just under just under 18 and then just under th- Did you know he was using any of the industrialized no, THC products? Not at all. Not at all. I had no idea. I had no idea. Um no. Not, I mean, I kind of had an idea that these kids were maybe vaping on the side and you know maybe someone had brought some cannabis to a party. That that's sort of what I was expecting just to have a chat. And I mean, constant chats over and over about, you know, do not go near it. you know i i i every time i would stop and hey, do you know that marijuana is addictive or do you know that you know you can't be using that because it affects your brain cells but that's how i kind of looked at it from is just just stay away from it and so we had a lot of chats and and i i never expected this at all this was so out of left field so out of left field 
So explain to us what came out of left field for you. So your previous guest was mentioning how he got this sense of a, a godlike complex that I'm better than you. Um, I'm smarter than you. And so that's sort of how it started to present itself. Um, and very defiant, just, just the defiance that we were noticing. It's like something that we had never witnessed before. I mean, the normal 16, 17, uh, you know, can I go out? Not today. Fine. I'll go to my room. I'll stay mad for 20 minutes and then I'll move on. You know, just the normal. Um, it would never be in a family to kind of say no. I mean, if it's someone that we know, then, then sure, you know, go ahead. But this was at another level. This was defiance to, I dare you, kind of like, I dare you to tell me otherwise. Mm -hmm. And so that's what we started to notice was this hyper godlike complex of superiority that, that, that we had never witnessed before. Um, and so leading up to that, I, I noticed that he wasn't sleeping very much. And then his speech was rapid. Friday night, he phoned us at about, you know, midnight saying, I have friends coming over. Um, and that's that. And it was like, well, no, <laughs> that's not how it works in this house. And his reaction was, fine, I'll just deal with whatever consequence comes out of it. And so that's when we thought something's up. And so that night, he, he did not come home. And at about eight in the morning, he was just completely gone, completely gone. You know, I couldn't recognize him anymore because he was just so out of touch with reality, completely out of touch with reality. Uh, there was just no, that 17 year old kid, you know, that, 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 that kid that I've, that, that I brought up was not that person at that time. It just wasn't. So he showed up at your home at 8 a.m. that morning? I went to pick him up at about 10, 10-ish or so. And then um, just, again, the godlike complex of how he was just the smartest being in the universe and we were just inferior to him. Um, and it was just that whole day was just what is going on. We had no idea. I had no idea. I had no clue what this was. Um, <laughs> Could you describe any more specific behaviors you were saying you were seeing maybe the way he was acting or what he was saying? Just. He had it in his brain that he was going to be a very famous person. And that anything that he touched was going to be worth millions of dollars. And so in his that was his core belief that he was going to be a very famous individual and there was no other way to to stop that. And so that's when my wife asked for help. I mean, we're like, what are we what are we dealing with here? We don't know what's going on. And so we phoned the non-emergency line. Um, and one of the things that as a society we need to start pushing is you can't send cops to something like this. This isn't an armed police officer knocking at your door because it's not, that, that's not what's required. You need some, 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 some other type of resource, not cops. They don't know what they're walking into. Lucky for us, he, um, cause he was super chatty that the, 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 the officers were able to kind of see through his personality, you know, um, and he talked for like a two hours nonstop. Mm -hmm. And that's when we knew something is not right here. Um, and, so was, and, and now, sorry, go ahead. Was he trying to manipulate the police officers, letting them know that he's okay? And, and no, and, no, okay. no, not at all. Uh, it, it, mainly because in his brain, there was nothing wrong. Mm -hmm. So there was nothing to explain that I'm okay. I mean, you know, and so, at that time, the police, the, the, the cop said, we're going to take him into the hospital. Um, you know, lucky for us, he was still a minor. Um, and so we were able to take him in and, and, and have, him, have him looked at. 
by by the emergency team. And so at that point, um, they just could see that there was something wrong. And then, you know, in hindsight, you start to look at what happened before that break and you start to see the pattern of, okay, that makes sense as to why you were acting that way. That makes sense as to why you were saying this. This was a buildup of about two weeks. It, it didn't just happen overnight. It was a buildup of progressing into, it's like a storm that's coming your way. And all of a sudden, as a parent, you don't know what you're dealing with. You have no idea. You're so lost. Um, you know, it, it's, you're, you're just so, you don't know what's happening. And th that's the reason why I want to share my stories because I want, I remember those early days, there was no one that I could reach out and talk to because no one understood what's going on. And it wasn't until I did a lot of research online and I I ran across uh, Hayden's podcast that I thought, oh my God, I mean, that's, that's it. Mm -hmm. And so that led me to this group, thankfully, because there's no pamphlet that that's given to you at the, you know, there's not a user guide that they're at the dispensary, cannabis dispensary that says in case break here, in case of emergency that, you know, they take your money and, and that's all they want. They don't they could care less about what's happening to you and your child. Right. So, so what, what Mike is describing here, and first of all, Mike, I just want to say, we're glad you found us. Um, we're sorry oh, you had yeah. to find us. Um, and, and we appreciate your courage to speak up. Um, and I hope that this is a catalyst for other families to come forward to and speak up and know that the Every Brain Matters community will protect your identity um, however you're comfortable coming forward and speaking. Um, we are in touch with thousands of families at this point. We were in the hundreds, now we're in the thousands. So we have many stories out there and um, many families impacted. Um, now, when your son got hospitalized, you, what you were witnessing, and it sounds like you, you described this kind of gut feeling you had two weeks prior to when you got to this day where he was having this godlike complex and um, yeah. this grandiosity. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, grandiosity belief. Yeah. yeah. So, so what you were witnessing um, is psychosis. Absolutely. It was ha yeah. having a break. Psychotic break. Yeah. yeah. And, and it was in induced by the THC that he was consuming. Now, when yes. he was hospitalized, you had told me before that they had kind of like this blanket diagnosis that at first um, uh, that you disagree with and know now, well, it looks, describe to us what happened next. What happened? How long was he hospitalized? And then what happened after he was hospitalized? So as soon as he got admitted, um, the doctors ran drug tests, but, what they didn't do was that urine test, because if you do a simple blood test, you're not going to pick up THC. You're going to pick up, they're looking for cocaine, they're looking for methamphetamines, because the way he was acting was very much like a cocaine high, like a meth, like a meth addict, just a rapid speech and just com high levels of energy. So when they came back with the results, in a way, I was kind of disappointed because I wanted some sort of explanation as to what's going on. Because if you don't, then the, the question is, so what are we dealing with here? And if there's no drug in the system, I mean, and this is how ignorant, you know, the medical community is that you wouldn't do a simple urine test knowing that you just legalized marijuana. Wouldn't you want to also see if there's THC in a system? And they, they don't know. Like yeah. what I'm finding is the medical community is not prepared for this. They don't, they have what's called the DSM-5, the diagnostics and, and uh, I can't remember what the S is, manual. And they, someone comes in and they, they, they go check, 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 check. And the DSM says that this is what you're dealing with. And that's what they tell you. They don't, they don't know that cannabis induced psychosis is a thing that you need to treat completely different from any other mental health issues. Not to say that it won't trigger it. But you can't blanket everything with the DSM-5 at this point because you are dealing with a lot of um, kids going into the, the ER with, with psychosis. There was, a, there was a study in San Diego that had up to 35 cases a day of psychosis in the ER 
and and I think doctors don't realize what's some of them do, but the majority of them don't. They don't. You come in and and you, you present this way. You're, you're you're showing signs of schizophrenia. You're showing signs of um you know delusions of grandeur. It must be this, and and that's and that's how they they, they treat it. I think you make some very very valid points. One is that. THC can't be tested in the blood. It's a fat soluble drug. It's different from the other drugs. Exactly. And and that's why it is so dangerous too. Not that the other drugs aren't dangerous, but your son required a urine test. And um, sometimes they need to be testing the hair. Um, It's just a different way they need to test with it. And so that they are going with their old school way and, and ignoring the science. So there's a lack of education um, and you said you said a very valu- valuable point that the medical system is not prepared for all the cannabis induced psychosis that they are seeing with our loved ones, and that is so true. And not only is the medical system not prepared, families aren't prepared. They no. have they have no, no clue. So no. That, that's why this podcast is so important that a father like you is coming forward and speaking up because it'll raise awareness and it will help. Yeah parents and and families make decisions if they are seeing these types of symptoms in their, their children. So thank you for coming forward. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. And, and, and it was sort of validating the the last, the last interview that you had with that mom and son just validated so many things. And this is why I wanted to share my story because I want other parents to know that if you're seeing these signs, if you have, if you're, if your son changed to a brand new group of friends that you've never met, if you see that, because the way that it presents is in this godlike superiority complex. That's how it, it it seems to be the way that the classic example of cannabis-induced psychosis is not schizophrenia. It's not bipolar disorder. It's not, it doesn't present in a way that is, is, is a negative um, symptom such as depression. You, he's not, you know, you're going to see your son acting as if he's going to be the next famous rock star in the world. And if you start to see that, that's a telltale sign that something's going on. Yeah. And um, I thank you for, um, that was Linda and Colby you were referring to. Amazing. Amazing. So, you know, Colby, know that your voice matters and that maybe more young people like you will come forward and, and talk about their experience. Now, you make a very valid point. If the THC wasn't involved, then there wouldn't be a diagnosis of bipolar or Never. schizophrenia. Never. Um, Never. But we need the audience to understand that um, more than 50% of these uh, people that have experienced cannabis-induced psychosis, and yes, it's more prevalent in the younger brain, but any adult can experience it too. Um, yeah. uh, more, Most of them will recover. And the, the key to recovery is not use THC anymore and then get the support and services around that individual and family that they need to recover. But the scary part of this drug, um, especially if they continue to use, yes. is that THC has the highest conversion rate out of all the drug out of all the drugs from those temporary psychosis symptoms to chronic psychiatric disorders like schizophrenia and bipolar with psychosis. So that's why it's, you know, Mike's voice is just so important here. Um, so listen to what he's describing to you so so you can make the right decisions um, and educate your loved ones. So yeah. Mike, after your son was discharged from the hospital, um, what was life like at that point? Did your son accept that THC was the cause of the psychosis? Was he still in psychosis when he got out of the hospital? So this is what I want parents to understand is that, and I wish, God, I wish I had someone to guide me through those days because I was lost. All I had was Google and YouTube and and, and the DSM-5 and, and people that have gone through it. Thank God for those YouTubers that, that have shared their experience. Thank God for the podcasters on 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 Spotify that that have shared their story because it was it was so rewarding and so thankful that I was able to 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 pinpoint what was happening um so the hospitalization lasted for his high started to come off of it at about three days 
So by the fourth day, we were back to about 80%, 85%. You know, no longer was the rapid speech. Um, keep in mind that the medications that they will give you at the hospital are pretty high power antipsychotics that are meant to kill every single pressure point in your brain because they have to address what they're dealing with. They don't know what they don't know. And so if someone comes in with, with super excited brain that can't sleep, they're going to put you in antipsychotics. Um, they're going to put you in a and They're going to put you into Seroquel. They're going to put you into whatever it works. And they'll try different ones, antipsychotics too, to the point that they can start to see a bit of a reaction to it. Thankfully, and this is where it was even more evidence that we were dealing with cannabis because the fact that he was able to come off of it in three, four days was a, now that I'm doing now that I've done all my research, that's a great sign. Because if if you're not and, and this is the scary part for parents is that no one tells you that you're gonna go to a hospital. No one describes what it's like to be in a psychiatric hospital. And it was such a gut punch to look at my son. We were just jumping for joy that he just got accepted into, into the program at the university with his high grades just a month before. And I can't describe to you the feeling of walking into the psychiatric ward and seeing your child who is just this bright, beautiful human being in those green pajamas that they give them behind a glass. It, and it, it just takes your breath away. It, it just, that, that is the hardest thing that a parent can go through is to come face to face with that reality that you're in a psychiatric hospital. And I don't know if, if someone can, has been through that, that is, a, that is the most gut-wrenching feeling for any parent to be in at this point. You don't know what you're dealing with. You don't know what the future is going to look like. And that's the toughest part because you're starting on this road and you don't know what you're dealing with. And the politicians don't, don't tell you that. The people that are passing these laws, they don't, they don't understand what it's like to, I, I would love for them to experience one night at a psychiatric ward before they should be mandated to spend a day at the psychiatric ward before they go the next day and put in their vote for legalization of, of high power THC. You know, that should be a requirement. Go see what it's like, go see to the ground and see what it's like to be dealing with, 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 with a teenager that you in a million years would think would end up here. Oh, Mike, that is such a good point. And I, I want to share with you in the audience that, um, you know, I'm from Pueblo, Colorado, which I call ground zero of the marijuana expansion movement. And we have the physicians there that have spoke out from day one when we saw the psychosis and the hyperemesis coming from um, these industrialized THC products. And there's Dr. Karen Randall. She's an ER physician in Pueblo, Colorado. And since 2015, she has publicly invited legislators from out the world, from other states to come follow yeah. her just on a shift in the ER to see what she's seen. Um, yeah. Because she sees it in young children. She sees it in uh, geriatric patients. Um, it is horrible. And she's still out there today. And there's just this core group of doctors from Pueblo that I am so appreciative that do that. So yeah, go go see the reality of what this is, because the legislators are going to the fancy shiny shops that have the, yeah. the flavored vapes and candies and making it look cool and sexy. Um, yeah. They don't see the reality of what it's like for a parent to walk in and see their child in a psychotic state. Yeah, that, no one, no one tells you that. No one prepares you for that. That's a, that's another level of. That's another level of just parenting. You know, uh, that's not what your dreams for this kid is. That's not what you've worked so hard to get them away from. You know, try to protect them as much as you can, and and to see that is just, you know, but. You know, thank you, thanks to the doctors that 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 helped too. I mean, we luckily we had one doctor that wasn't quite convinced that what we were dealing with was a serious mental health issue. She just didn't. The signs weren't there. There has never there, he, 
this is a kid that had just finished his baseball season at a high level. This is a kid that was getting ready for university. We had never before dealt with any of this. This is not something that when it's when you're dealing with that with a with a mental health emergency, just like there are signs for for cannabis induced psychosis, there are signs for bipolar disorder, there are signs for schizophrenia that they did it don't sh- just show up in one day there you can kind of pinpoint to certain things that wasn't the case with us this had yeah. never happened to us this was a hundred percent cannabis high level thc concentrate that caused this hospitalization and this and this chaos in their family yeah a hundred percent yeah and it, it it drives me nuts when people say well the weed was laced with something i'm like no no, no, no it's the, no. it's the thc a hundred percent yeah and and yeah. and and that message has got to be heard. So I, I love the way, Mike, you talked about that gut feeling that you had, you know, two weeks prior, and that you kept looking for solutions and following that gut feeling because you're like, this isn't my kid, right? This isn't who he is. This has got to yeah. be drug induced. And um, and so uh I give you a lot of kudos to to be in there for your son and continuing to ask the hard questions and look for the education. So when he came home from the hospital, did he accept that THC no. was the cause of this? No. no, no, he was adamant. Um, and now everything's hindsight 2020, right? At that time, when I was looking at the signs, I, I did not in a million years think we were going to end up in the hospital. I just thought, oh, you know, great. I never seen my son this confident. I never seen him go and act that way at the mall. I've never seen him do that. I thought, now that I look back, I'm like, how did I miss that? It was right there, right in front of me. So a lot of the things that I'm saying are is now two years of, of research. Uh, the amount of research that I've done on this topic, I spent countless hours reading papers, understanding different perspectives, knowing what's going on. And the research up to this point, you'll find that a lot of doctors are very they can correlate and say, yes, that's it. But in true scientific form, they got to run more studies and do more analysis for them to say cannabis and do psychosis is a real thing. The DSM-5 has touched on it. And, and this is where I challenged the doctors when they came up with, the, oh, it's bipolar. The DSM-5 says that if there is drugs in the system that are causing a psychotic episode, you cannot give a a diagnosis of, of mental health until you've cleared that out of the system. This person has been recovered for two years. And that's what they don't tell you. The recovery process is not just, oh, your son's away. He's gone from the hospital. Life doesn't get back to, to what you think it's going to be. This is going to be an up and down process. It takes, Hayden was saying that it took him four years to, to, for his brain to get back to where it was. And that's what I want parents to understand that, sure, you're going to have a psychotic break. You know, God forbid you don't. But if it does happen, don't expect a quick recovery. Some people do. But just know that you're in for the long haul. And if that doesn't scare people into facing the reality of of high potency THC, I don't know what else will. Just that fact alone that just because you're son or daughter get discharged from the hospital does not mean that life gets back to normal. You're now going to deal with the crash. So yes. to get back to your point, he was still at that time did not believe that it was THC. And it's almost as if when he got released from the hospital, his brain wasn't back to normal because he was still a little bit up. And that's what the doctor told us is that, you know, he's going to be a little bit up and down. Just, just be patient. She did give us medication. She prescribed it for six months. And this is the other thing when I'm talking about doctors don't know how to deal with this because you don't, once you send someone home, you don't prescribe the same dosage of antipsychotics that you prescribe in the hospital to bring him down. You can't do that because once the brain starts to level off, my son experienced like the worst withdrawals from, from the drug that they were giving him that he just did not want it. 
And so that's the other thing is challenge the doctors. If they're going to give you drugs, make sure that it's the right medication that they're going to put them on because you cannot prescribe the same amount of antipsychotics that you used on day one and day 20, because it's not the same thing. So be very careful with that. Um, and so he wanted off the meds. We went to see the doctor. Um, and basically what the doctor told us, she sat us down and she said, the reason why I'm going to make the decision to get you off the meds is because you seem to have a very strong family network that is going to be there to support you. Had you been by yourself or, you know, if I didn't feel comfortable that, you know, your parents have been in the hospital every day with you, I wouldn't let you off the mat. So, you know, she was confident enough that this was just a one-off, but an 18 year old with a group of friends that THC is, is, is now in every Drake song that you hear and it's glamorized and, um, and joked about and joked about. And it's, it's, it's part of an 18 year old hip hop video culture of I'm going to go buy an EpiPen. And how do you, how do you now convince an 18 year old that, Hey buddy, you just came out of a hospital. Maybe, maybe stop. And in a way I'm, you know, he needed to find that out on his own because a month after that, we were back in the same hospital room with another psychotic break because he had just tried to prove to himself that weed is not, it's not harmful and it doesn't cost that. So the second hospitalization was even worse because at this point, the doctor was very specific with them to say, you cannot go near cannabis. Um, and just to see the look in her face, the disappointment in this doctor's face to know that even though your parents have told you this, you still want to run your own experiment to see that this is not a cause. I mean, that's how entrenched this culture of it's just weed. It's not going to harm you. It's not addictive. You can get it's medicinal. It's great for stress. It's look how look at all the benefits that hemp has. You can even make sweaters out of it. Right. That's the culture that we have. Look at all the hemp products that are in the, in, in the market. It's God's plant. This isn't God's plant. This is a chemical that the industry has laced with other chemicals to, to just imagine this, to be able to mask the odor of these products. Imagine the amount of chemicals that they have to lace it with to be able to kill that smell. So you're not dealing with the old crumple of you're going to, take a pair of scissors and chop it up. And you're not dealing with that anymore. You're dealing with a highly, highly addictive chemical that is causing havoc in young brains. The research says that if you have, if you're prone to mental health in your family, chances are that high power THC will cause issues. And most people don't know that. Most people don't talk about their family mental health history because it's not something that you bring up. So, if you are going to go that route, do your research. You wouldn't go on the highway without a seatbelt. Think of it this way. You need to understand that if there's mental health issues in your family, chances are this will trigger something. And what the doctors are finding now is that even if there is no mental health issues, the drug is so high and potent that it will cause something regardless of your mental health history in your family. So it's Thank scary. You. Thank you for clarifying that because we do need to get both messages out there that you are at higher risk if you do have a family history of mental illness, but you don't have to have that to have severe consequences yeah, of these products exactly. like this, the cannabis induced psychosis. So thank you for yeah. describing that. So then what happened with this hospitalization? Um, the second one was, again, you know, once your brain goes there, there's no bringing it back. Your brain is, is expecting that anytime THC hits it, it's not a matter of if you're going to go psychotic, it's a matter of you will go psychotic and for how long. And, and the second time was scary because now I'm like, what are we dealing with here? The second time was when in between the two, he came to me and he said, this is what I had smoked. So now I knew what I, because the first time I had no idea what was happening. 
I'm like, why is this? Look, what's going on here? And I was so relieved when he came to me and said, here's what I smoked. So we looked it up online. Um, a friend of his had given him an EpiPen. Is it an yeah. EpiPen? A, dis- a distillate pen. A distillate a, pen. Like a vape pen. Like a like vape, a vape pen. pen that had 95% THC. Wow. And the reason why up to that week is because he got to a point where he had smoked so much that day that he felt like his brain had changed. Hmm. He said that he got to a point where he wasn't even high anymore. It was as if he had come across the other side. And he knew that something was not right at that point. Something felt different when he smoked that. Um, he had smoked before, but it was like one off, you know, here and there. This was a consistent or a period of two weeks. And because it was an early sign of something's going on, his brain wasn't sleeping. He, he, he couldn't sleep. So in order for him to get sleep, he would hit the pen every night to try to get some sleep. So imagine that poor brain for a period of two weeks getting hit with high concentration of THC every night just to try to force yourself to sleep. And, and, and no wonder why it just broke. It really got to the point where the brain just had it. Um, you know, what happens is your dopamine receptor just breaks. It floods your brain with dopamine, with this super exciting chemical that now you have all this, your chemical balance is completely gone at that point. And so that, that was the first time. And then in between the first and second is when I started to go and do some research as to can cannabis cause this. And it was just eye-opening to see the cases and, and, the, and, and people that have gone through this. Um, the second stint lasted a little longer because I think the doctor was trying to make a point. But again, um, she was just surprised how fast he came off of it. Because she goes, go ahead. Did he, did he accept then at some point that the THC was causing the psychosis? Not during the hospital, but what came after, and this is what people don't get you prepared for, was a crash that lasted about six months of just the most horrific depression that he anyone had ever experienced. Um, suicidal ideations. Um, and, and the more research I do is absolutely what happens is you, you know, I think that if you, if you combine the first hospitalization with the second hospitalization, what the doctor said is that was just one prolonged episode. He never came out. He, he, the episode that triggered it never really subsided because we took him off the meds and then his brain was in a constant state of, of starting to recover. But the fact that he went and hit it again with, with THC, now your brain is all the all those chemicals that are in your brain are now starting to rebalance and this is what happens to the brain is now you're dealing with the crash and now you're dealing with and a a lot of it was anxiety of what did i do what did i say The, the the shame the guilt was what was killing him it's like why did i say that why because this is a shy kid normally you know, this, is a, this isn't someone that would go up to someone on the street and just start talking about random, right? And so a lot of the issues that he was dealing with was just, how are people going to view me now? And so he struggled with that. Is I've made an asset of myself. I made a joke out of myself. And how are people going to view me? And so a lot of the depression was triggered by the OCD because what they don't tell you is that once you come up from a high like that, the crash that you experience is is horrific and no one tells you that nobody tells you that you know i'm i'm so glad mike that you're describing it as the crash the withdrawing from thc coming back to the reality the realization excuse me and and you mentioned just the shame they feel just the shame around Oh my gosh, what happened? Yes. And so they're even at higher risk to use not only THC, but other 
drugs because they simply want to change the way they feel. They don't yeah. want to feel the shame. They don't want to feel the depression. And so this process of recovery, the crash that happens after the psychotic breaks is real and it's life-threatening and there needs to be even more support than ever, not only for that individual, but the for the family at loan, because the family is now living in fear of what's going to happen. How are we going to deal yeah. with this? And then dealing with the shame and trying to connect. So thank you so much for bringing that up. And that was, that, that, that is, again, that's not in a poster when you walk into a dispensary. That, that's not in a video that, that that's glamorizing. Uh, I wish Drake made a song about coming off of a psychotic episode. You know? Yeah. Do a yeah. do a rap song about that. Yeah. Not yeah. not not, not glamorize it about how you hit an ep- a, a distillate pan to go to sleep. Like I mean, and that's what these kids are being bombarded with. They don't they don't know the other side. They're they're getting the cool side of it. And these these pants are sexy. Have you seen one of them? They're cool. I I want one. They're you sleek. Know, yep. They're sleek. sleek. Cool. They're, they're, it's like, mm-hmm. but it's it's. You're poisoning you. You, 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 you. Yeah, it's it's scary. It's scary, and then the flavors just mask, like you said, the chemical taste, the foul. Oh yeah, you taste. I mean, oh, it's yeah. it's purposeful. These are purposeful delivery devices to cause a chemical assault to the brain and hijack yeah. the brain for a few people to profit, for a government to profit. Yeah, exactly. For a, a, a state. Um, in the United States to profit. And here we are, the families are experiencing this and some recover and some don't. Some don't. Now, no. thank, thank God your family is still recovering. Um, how did you guys get through that crash? What, were, what are some of the tips and um, tools you can share with our families to get through that? The turning point for us was so after the doctor, the initial doctor saw him, she still, because we were still dealing with what are we dealing with here? Um, the amount of research that I did in between the first and second episode, I had hundreds and, and hundreds of, of studies about cannabis and psychosis. So I showed it to the doctor. Um, she saw it, but she still not 100% convinced that this was due to cannabis. She was still... You know, we might be dealing with with bipolar disorder. So that loomed in the background. And again, the reason why I decided to come on this and, and, and just make sure that you are going to hear that. They're not going to call it, you know, some doctors will. A, a very small percent will, will look at you and say, this is we're dealing with cannabis. And if you have stains from cannabis, you know, chances are that you'll recover. 95%, 90% of doctors are not going to tell you that. They're going to tell you that based on their training and based on their clinical experience, what you're dealing with is most likely a bipolar disorder. And if that doesn't put fear in your heart that that's what you're going to be dealing with, I don't know what else will. Because that when you hear those words, as a parent of a child that has a future ahead of them or her, you don't you, you don't want to deal with that. You don't want to hear that. You don't want to and and but at the same time, I didn't want to be we didn't want to be that family because I, I you know I see it. I get it why you're saying that. And what she told us is I'm gonna put in cannabis in there because it needs to go, you know, but I'm not ruling anything yet because the other thing that they don't tell you is. To get a diagnosis of bipolar disorder takes years. It's not something that you just take the temperature and you check the pulse and here's your diagnosis. It takes years for someone to do that. Some doctors get it. Some doctors don't. Some doctors are new to it. Some doctors are just getting going in their career. So if the DSM-5 say this is it, then that's it. We then switched to another doctor because this one was no longer, um, he had now turned 18. And now we're dealing with a doctor that I think she never dealt with these cases before. She didn't have access to her records, so she couldn't read the notes. She didn't know the background. She just saw it. And, and now she's telling this kid that most likely you're dealing with a bipolar disorder. 
without knowing any history. And now how do you tell that to an 18 year old? How do you tell that? How do you, how does an 18 year old now negotiate that, that that's what I'm dealing with. And at, at this point, I'm still not a hundred percent convinced because I'm reading all the data. I'm looking at all the research. I'm seeing that this only happens when this, like this only came up when this happened, not any other time. And so I remember going to my family doctor and I'm like, could we get another doctor to see him? Doctors don't like to be questioned. That's what I've learned for as great as they are. And I'm not an anti-doctor. I'm not an anti-vaxxer. I'm pro-science. Um, but they don't like to be questioned. And the message that I got was, you don't, you know, in, in, in the medicine field, we don't like to give second opinions because whatever the doctor said, it's what it is. And so I'm still not convinced. I'm still not. And, and that's my message to parents. Do your research, push back, um, you know, just know that if there is cannabis involved, most likely it's called cannabis induced psychosis and tell the doctors that the DSM-5 has said that if there is any sort of substance in the system, you cannot give that diagnosis unless you've checked off that mark. Lucky for us, we were able to, this doctor, because she didn't have the records or hadn't read the case or didn't have the notes, she referred him to another doctor. And that was a turning point for us is we were lucky and thankful and blessed. And I think God had a hand in it to put us into the right doctor that was able to read his file, that was able to understand. And that first time that we met with him, he said, yeah, I mean, where you're dealing, what you're dealing with is, is marijuana induced and you cannot smoke marijuana again. Um, again, and just because you hear that doesn't mean that everything's back to, to where it should be. It's not. This is a long, long, long road ahead of ups and downs. He might go up, he might go down. Because the brain, a 17, 18-year-old brain, still trying to get back to where it was. THC is like taking a sledgehammer and knocking all these different areas of your brain out of sync. And so as the brain's starting to sink back, you are going to have those issues. You have to be patient. Medications play a role. And, and, and to this day, we're still, we're still under medication because we, you know, him and I are like, we don't want to take a chance. So don't be, be open to it. It's a tool. Um, it's not all of it. Not everyone needs it. I'm not, I'm not trying to say that. Not everyone needs it. But if it's something that it's not causing any more harm, then just be patient with it. Be patient. Don't be in a rush to try to get off the meds. That's this is not what this is. You need support. You need the doctors. You need family. You need therapy. You go, it's it's. This is a whole issue of. It's a team effort, and every single tool that you have at your disposal, you have to use it. Such good points. Um, thank you so much. So it's been two years now. Is that correct? And he's still recovering. So, we're coming up on two years. Um, after the doctor met with him, what he did diagnose him with was ADAD, which we knew from an early age that he most likely had ADHD. And so the doctor was able to provide a, a formal diagnosis of it. And now with that in mind, now it makes even more sense as to why the THC wreak havoc as it did, because an ADHD brain, when you introduce THC, it will have it, it. It's that's that was another thing that you need to be mindful of is that because of his ADHD that went undiagnosed, the effects of THC just triple the, the chances of him going into a psychotic break. Now put him at a higher risk. Put him at a higher risk. And so having met this doctor just completely changed our lives because now we were dealing with the ADHD. Um, and it's been, he just finished his first year of university, going into second year university, and, and he's better grades than he's ever gotten. Mm. And yes. so, you know, we're thankful for the doctor. We're thankful that I didn't give up. I didn't just take it for face value. I, I did my research. I, 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 I reached out. I talked to people. I'm still doing research. I'm still trying to understand this, but 
it's scary. As a society, we don't have the tools to deal with this, and we don't know how to deal with this. But, but thank God your son has a father like you that wasn't giving up and was searching for the truth. And you followed your gut, you followed your faith, and you showed up for him and still show up for him. And now, now you're showing up for other families so they can have the tools and the resources and, and, and the hope that if you refrain from the THC use, you can recover. Um, yeah. So thank you for that. Yeah, it's um, we're not out of the woods yet. I mean, I'm not. I think I, I, I think I, I, we've given ourselves a five year timeline to make sure. But you know, every day, every day that 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 he wakes up and and we're able, it's just a blessing, and you start to appreciate those days that are good because what we just went through was just horrific, horrific, and I don't wish that on anybody at all. You do not want to go through this. You, if you can avoid it, if you can educate yourself, if you can talk to your kids, if you can talk to their friends, because that's who has the influence over your kids. You get to a point where, as a parent, you can only do so much. Yeah. And, and who's re- you know, who's really raising your kids is the group of friends that they're hanging out with. That's who has the most influence on them. So true. And I think parents don't realize that. I mean, parents do play a role. We play a part, but... Yep. not above their peer group. And, no. and so let's recognize that these young people that are recovering from CIP or cannabis induced psychosis or, or addiction, they're out in a world where most of their peers are using. So they have to work yep. even extra hard to, to stay away day. from it. Yeah. For the rest to of their day. lives. Right. Like every time he goes out, my, my, my heart, just because I know for a fact that a couple of his friends are still using. Yeah. So you know, I, I, I'm like, hey, but you know now, you, you've done your own research, you've done your own studies, you should know what this does, yeah. right? And and so, you know, thankfully, I, he, you know, nothing major. I, we're going to come up in two years and then, and, and yeah, yeah, it's, it's been, it's been a, a huge improvement from where we were to where we are now. Yeah. And imagine a living in a world that on every corner, there's a, a marijuana shop or an industrialized THC shop telling people every corner, every corner that this is medicine and it's yeah. less harmful than alcohol. I'm sorry, yeah. hitting, um, taking a couple drinks of alcohol or does not induce a psychotic episode like THC no. does. So no. that that message has got to change. People have got to know uh, you, you can swallow one um, THC edible and have a psychotic episode. You can't yeah. have one swallow of alcohol and have a psychotic episode. It's not it's the same thing. Not, not the, same thing. the same thing. No. Yeah. It's like playing Russian roulette. Yes. You're really playing Russian roulette. It might not happen. Chances are it won't happen. But there's that 10% that you just don't know. And why would you take a risk with something like that? Why and, would you, why do you need that in your life to begin with? Yeah. And that's complicated enough as it is without drugs. And that 10% rate that you just, that you just talked about is old school, low potent THC. Exactly. That's, that's not the new stuff. So it is a game of Russian roulette 100%. And, and everybody's threshold is different, but the younger the brain, the more frequent the use, the higher content of THC, the yes. higher risk. and yeah. And for a young brain who's consistently using these industrialized THC products that have been legalized through our government, it's not if something bad will happen. It's just a matter of time. It's just a matter of time. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. It's that's why I wanted to to make sure that if this happens to you, you're not alone. Um, you know, reach out. Your your group, Aubrey, has done an amazing job. Thank you. I mean, you were just a godsend. Mm. I remember when I stumbled upon your page and your and your title, Every Brain Matters, it's just it's so important. You know, we need to help you expand and, and 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 broaden your reach because what you've done for me was it's a it's like I I, I stumbled upon water in an oasis at that time I was lost I had no idea where to turn I had no idea who to talk to and and, and yeah it's just it was so rewarding to see that 
I wasn't alone. It's not, it didn't just happen to me. It's happening a lot. And God forbid that you challenge that you, you're labeled as a, as a Bible thumper Trump supporter. If you, yeah. if you say that, that THC is, is causing this, it's, it's kind of into the political realm that, you know, when I talk to people about this, you just kind of see the look in their face. Like, what are you talking about? I'm like, you know what? If you don't experience it, if you've never seen it, then you don't understand what I'm talking about. Oh, that's so true. It's so true. And um, even legislators, I've had conversations with elected officials and I'm describing everything yeah. that we've talked about today. And they look at me like, oh, you're crazy. Oh, you're just a prohibitionist. Yeah. And I'm exactly. like, I'm like, no, this isn't about prohibition. This no. is about enabling mental illness and addiction. And in the most vulnerable populations are the most affected, like our youth or disadvantaged yes. communities, like the one I come from um, in Pueblo, Colorado, you are literally providing poison in pretty packages with fun flavors. That's what you're legalizing. You you think 100%. you're you think you're doing this for social justice. This is a social injustice. And not only are our families paying a price, but society as a whole is paying a huge price. Yeah. Not, not everybody who experiences a psychotic episode becomes violent, no. but, some, but some do. Oh, and, absolutely. And, it's a and, break. You don't know. Yeah. You have no control. You, you, you have no control. The, the prison has no control. You as a parent have no control. You're at the mercy of whatever the brain is going to do. And the people that are having that experience of that psychotic break, guess what? They're scared. And sometimes they have delusions and hallucinations that they're yeah. going to be harmed. So then they reach out and harm other people. So the violence that we're seeing across the world uh, um, that, that we are seeing in the U.S. is connected to what I call the expansion of industrialized THC. So, Mike, we thank you from the bottom no, of our thank hearts. thank you. For... Thank you, really, Aubrey. You have no idea what you did. No. You have no idea when I found this group and I was able to see that people went through this. It's, it's, it's validating and it gives you hope because it's not, it's not always schizophrenia. It's not always bipolar disorder. But do not put that aside. I mean, that is the real issue that you're going to be dealing with. So thank you. Um, thank you. Keep, keep, keep up the good work. Let us know how we can help. Um, thank you so yeah. much, Mike. Let's, we'll invite the audience to go to everybrainmatters.org. Join us, donate. We can't do this without you. We need to yes. support these families. We have a family support group that meets every Wednesday. You just go to everybrainmatters.org, click the meeting tab at the top and find out what what um, um, so family support meetings we do offer. So, and for anybody who is looking to recover from marijuana addiction or psychosis, there is Marijuana Anonymous. And we have all those resources on our website too. So thank you very much, Mike. I have one last question for you. Yes. What is what is a solution to you? What what do you think is, is and I know it's probably multifactorial, but what is a one or two things that you would like to see change when it comes to this new era of industrialized THC? If you remember back in the 90s or late 90s, early 2000s, when the meth epidemic hit, do you remember those pictures of people from day one to like six months into, into meth and how, how it brought it down to reality for people? Remember how the billboards were? were everywhere like this is a, what like the meth phase remember like the meth phase um we need to we are now at a point where this is becoming the new meth issue of the early 2000s we need to treat it as such we need to make sure that we're funding um, awareness campaigns that it's not a meth phase but a psychotic phase we should call it that this is psychosis. This is what it looks like. This is a video of someone in a psychotic state. This is what a mental institution looks like. This is what bipolar disorder is. This is what, you know, you need to raise that awareness. You need to counteract the sexiness of THC with the reality of what's happening in the ground. This is your son on a, this is your, this is your brain on THC. Remember that egg cracking on the, on the, on the, instead of an egg, put the face, put someone with a psychotic episode and say, this is your brain on THC. 
And if you don't believe it, you know, just just Google cannabis induced psychosis and look at the amount of research and the amount of people that have gone through this. So I know that I just gave you a long winded answer, but mm. we need to bring the reality to what call it what it is. Stop calling it um, cannabis induced psychosis. Call it THC induced psychosis. And this is your brain on it. And have billboards and have ads on TV um, of what it is. Um, I would love to see people that have gone through this stand outside a cannabis dispensary and say, "Do you realize what you're walking into?" If you're if you're a young, you know, we just need to bring awareness. Not everyone's going to go through it, but chances are that you are playing Russian roulette. Just more awareness. Just understand that this is not the weed of of of, um, of the '60s. This isn't Woodstock weed anymore. This is a chemical that's killing people. Thank you so much, Mike. Well said. Thank you. I really appreciate your efforts, Aubrey. Have a great day. The expansion of marijuana and other drugs has overwhelmed our country and has become a regular part of our culture. This new age of industrialized THC allows predatory practices and well-funded campaigns to target vulnerable populations with minimal accountability. Our neighborhoods and schools are becoming unsafe, and families are undereducated and have minimal tools and resources to prevent, manage, and recover from the impacts of marijuana addiction, psychosis, toxicity, and other mental challenges that come from these products. Our legislators are consistently hearing from drug advocates and lobbyists, and they do not hear enough from us. If you want to change this, we invite you to join us. We need your support. Please visit and sign up for a monthly donation at everybrainmatters.org. The Every Brain Matters community needs your support. Please give us a donation and like and share our podcasts to raise awareness of the harms of marijuana and the drug culture expansion.